Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today we'll be talking to Drs. Doug Kobos and Colin Campbell about soil measurements on Mars. In 2008, NASA launched the Phoenix Mars Lander to take measurements on Mars. Though their primary mission was related to the possibility of unfrozen water, two scientists from Meter Group got the opportunity to attach a soil sensor as well. This episode, Doug and Colin share their experiences working with NASA, the ups and downs of creating sensors for extraterrestrial environments, and what their sensor found. Don't forget to stick around to the end to listen to our new student spotlight section as well. We'll talk more about all that in a minute, but before we dive in, we wanted to thank our sponsor for this episode, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Dr. Doug Kobos and Dr. Colin Campbell with us. Doug is a senior research scientist and the director of environmental instrumentation at Meter Group. He also holds an adjunct appointment in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University, where he co-teaches environmental biophysics with Dr. Campbell. Doug's advanced degrees are from Texas A&M and the University of Minnesota in soil science. Doug was the lead engineer for the Thermal and Electrical Conductivity Probe, or TSEP, that flew to Mars aboard NASA's 2008 Phoenix Scout Lander and is the subject of this podcast. His current research is focused on instrumentation development for use in soil plant and atmospheric research. Colin is a senior research scientist with Meter Group and serves as the vice president of research and development. Colin has spent the last 21 years developing sensors to make measurements in the soil plant atmosphere continuum and teaching these principles around the world. Together with his colleagues, he works to solve problems related to climate change and agriculture. His latest work has been focused on combining measurement scales for a more complete picture of water availability to crops. Hi, Colin. Hi, Doug. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Abby. Doing good. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. We are so glad to have you on today. We are talking about soil measurements on Mars. Um, So this is very exciting for me. Um, Listeners may not know this, but uh, our podcast was inspired in part by me learning about people doing science, soil science on the moon. So I've always wanted to cover soil science in space as a topic and it's wish fulfillment (laughs) made, made real today on the show. Thank you for being on. To get us started, um, I mentioned the Phoenix Lander project in the intros, but can you give us just an overview of what that project was, what they were hoping to do, why they went there in the first place? Can you talk about that? I guess we could talk a little bit about that. Um, So Phoenix was a pretty important mission for for NASA and for for JPL and and maybe for humanity in that it was the... um, you know, a mission that was sent up specifically to try and find, unequivocally find evidence of water on Mars. So that was the whole mission. It wasn't a rover that was up there for, you know, uh, years and years, but just a, a real short duration mission that they sent up to the polar region of Mars where they were pretty sure they had sensed some water ice and they were looking for it and they wanted, you know, proof. So this was a proof mission. Okay. And can you tell us what JPL stands for? Oh, sorry. JPL is uh, NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Perfect. And how did you all get involved with this project? So that was actually before Doug came to what was then Decagon Devices. We changed our name a few years ago to Meter Group, but... We had attended the American Geophysical Union meeting in, I don't know, the early 2000s. And Decagon had an instrument that measures thermal properties in soil. It's actually a, an instrument that was developed out of the lab of, of Galen Campbell, my father, who was a soil physicist at Washington State University. 
And Decagon sold the sensor and was just advertising it there or, or demoing it there as a part of the the trade show. And AGU actually combined scientists from a lot of different disciplines. And during the show, one of the NASA scientists who just attends because there's a group there that, that does interplanetary science, he happened to be walking by the booths and he actually saw the KD2 sensor that we built. This is a, a small needle that gets pushed in the soil and you push a button and it tells you something about the thermal conductivity of that soil. And he asked a strange question, something like, hey, could we do this on Mars? And one of my colleagues was there, Matt Galloway, and he said, well, I'm not really sure, but why not? I'll, I'll ask the guys back home. And instead of waiting for him to ask an email, when I was sitting by the phone on a Friday afternoon, a scientist who was a colleague of this person who saw the sensor called me up and said, hey, my name is Martin Bueller and I work for JPL. And just like you asked, I didn't really know what JPL or who JPL was. I, I knew, kind of remembered a little bit the, the acronym. It would have been cooler if he said the Jet Propulsion Laboratory because I would have known uh, the connection. But when he said JPL, I didn't know who they were. And he said, we're working on putting together a proposal for a project to go on the Phoenix lander in 2007 flying to Mars. And we would like Decagon to be a part of this. And I just told him no. Uh, because I, I mean, I, I, I'm excited about these type of projects like anybody. But at that time, now Meter Group now is, is I think we have about 350 employees. But at that time, Meter Group was 25 employees. And I'm like, you don't really have us picked well. I think you like to to work with these giant conglomerates, the, the ones you hear building the rockets, et cetera. And we're not one of those. We're, we're just a few people. We have three or four scientists, engineers who work here. And I don't think we, we'd be able to make something that you're wanting. And he was like, no, really, we work with NASA. Everybody wants to work with NASA. Wouldn't you, know, wouldn't you work with us? And I said, I don't think it's going to happen. He said, look, if I just come up with my colleague, Mike Hecht, and just talk to you guys, maybe you can just consult while we try to do it. And I said, well, it doesn't hurt if you want to come talk to us. You're welcome to. And again, Friday afternoon, he shows up. Sunday night, and they're meeting with us Monday morning. Apparently, this proposal, which I had no idea, was due like the following Friday. And so they they fly in, they they sit down with us, and it takes practically no time for them to convince us to to be a part of the mission. And and when you start talking about put, making measurements on Mars, that something you touch could go on to another planet, it it takes seconds to to be like, okay, we'll we'll do that. And it was funny. Because all my reserve from Friday, I don't even remember thinking about it on Monday. You know, hey, we're too small. They actually looked around the company and said, look, you know, little guys are who we like to work with. And I don't know that that's really true, but they were extremely convincing. And in fact, they still are extremely convincing because uh, Mike has called us up about a project on the moon as recently as two years ago and said, hey, you guys want to want to put this sensor on a moon project and I was supposed to say no, but I said yes again. Okay, so uh, you were working then on uh, developing the sensor or perhaps uh, modifying it to fit fit the needs um, of the specific project. So I'm just going to kind of throw a handful of questions and you can uh, <laughs> kind of uh, sift through them as you will. So, um, ha like, how was this handled as far as like who's responsible for what between like i mean obviously you all have backgrounds with you know soil science and and you know kind of the atmospheric science and things like that um but how do you match that with the engineers with the people at nasa you know how what information were you even trying to get and then like what specific to mars did you have to account for as far as you know 
whether that's the soil itself that's on Mars, temperatures, different kinds of, um, you know, atmospheric things. <laughs> Not a scientist, so just throwing out sciencey words. Uh, so, like, how did all of that work as far as making the sensor um, that you needed it to be? Well, the first thing we had to do was hire the guy who was going to get the job done. So that was that was my only piece of genius in this project besides telling them no. Uh was was to hire Doug in the process. And I, I can't even take credit because one of my colleagues, Brian Wacker, was the one who said, Hey, you know, your your old grad student bu student buddy Doug is finishing up his PhD at, at University of Minnesota. Why don't we we get him on the, in on this project? And and so I mean, that was one of the biggest things I was concerned about as a very small group of of kind of engineers and scientists, three or four. We needed someone who could could really manage this project. And Doug had just finished up. And I knew from from Texas A&M that he was extremely talented and could bring out a very large project because he already did work like that as we produced a Eddie Flux Tower in the marshes of Corpus Christi. And and I said, "Hey, Doug, do you want to come on over and and start on this project?" So that was that was the first key, and, and the rest of it was all up to Doug. Yeah, and I got to say that um, you know choosing between continuing a postdoc at Minnesota and going to work on a Mars probe, you know, I, I, I decided <laughs> on the Mars probe. See, seems fair. <laughs> ha! No, the, the, so so it's it's. It, I mean, this is it's a great question about about how you interact with with science and engineers and how we interact with interacted with with the jet propulsion laboratory and and Doug Doug's experience I mean we it depends on how much time you have but this was a real challenge it both was it created some unbelievable highs because the people there are very very talented there was one point in the project that almost just sent us completely off the rails as we switched a person we were working with to a new person and and I remember some pretty dark days for Doug trying to do that. Yeah, so I mean, I can give you some perspectives on this from a um, from a, a boots on the ground um, position. That you know, I was fresh out of grad school and as a soil scientist, and coming in to try and engineer a sensor that was supposed to fly to Mars in a couple of years, and you know, with very little engineering background, and so got to give you know pretty much all the credit for the design to, to Gail and to Colin's dad, who, who is not only, you know, a famous environmental biophysicist and soil scientist, but also a, a stellar engineer. And so, you know, that, that part was intimidating, trying to rub elbows with the, the JPL engineers who are top-notch engineers. Um, they, they go and find these guys and, and pay them a premium to come and work on work on Mars missions and being super green and having to design to far um, non-standard conditions like you alluded to, Abby, where, you know, super cold conditions and low pressures and we had to engineer and we had to test moreover to all of these conditions. And, and that was a bit intimidating trying to, you know, come with specialized electronic components that are not what they call space hardened and design instrumentation and then test it to make sure it's not going to fail with a high likelihood of, of, of success. And, and that part was, I mean, maybe I was too green to even get intimidated by it at the time, you know, just kind of, Hey, let's go, let's give it a try, see if it works. And Colin mentioned the name Mike Hecht. He was kind of the head guy for, for JPL on this and the, in the project leader. And he, maintained this can-do attitude and ended up writing a mountain of waivers to allow us to use regular old components, electronic components, instead of space-hardened components. And he did shield us from a whole lot of the, the, the pain that we would have felt otherwise, and, and it was really a joy to work with him. So I don't think we could have done any of this without Mike, quite frankly. And there was a, a big component of mechanical... Um, development that needed to be involved as well. The, we we had the the electrical where we needed to get parts, and and we used, as you say, Doug, the just regular parts, not not spec parts for space flight. 
But when you think about the mechanical design, it was also a pretty big challenge because when you think about inserting a sensor into a, a soil that potentially has ice in it, the one big thing they care about is that you don't destroy the mission by getting your sensor stuck in the ice or by bending the needles when you try to stick it in or by any other of a number of things that could go wrong. And so we had to sit there and start thinking about how do you design a sensor that can do that? You know, one, one of the challenges is that during during that measurement, you got to make sure that that the heat you're applying. So that, so what you do to measure thermal properties is apply heat to the soil and you watch how quickly it dissipates or how quickly it moves from from the point of heating to the point of measurement. And one of our challenges is that because of the Martian air pressure and the conditions that, that are there, a lot of the heat would move back through the body of the sensor into the, the adjacent needle if we didn't design it right. So we ended up having to find a new a piece of plastic that both would be robust enough to hold up to those temperatures. Doug, temperatures on Mars? No, I mean, we we started at like negative 70 C. I mean, that was kind of the, the nominal temperature, but huge temperature swings because they don't have much atmosphere to buffer that. So big radiative swings as the sun comes up and sun goes down. Right. So you could get up to positive and temperatures during the daytime during and we were at the 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 northern polar region so and this was in the summer the martian summertime and so those swings would be big so we had to choose a material that had a low thermal conductivity but but a a high strength and a, and a low um coefficient of expansion for heat there are a lot of things that had to go in there that that really pushed the level of at least our understanding of materials and and the way they they come together Wow. So you're really trying to design this sensor and mostly you were trying to get like heat thermal properties from the soil and then check for that water, right? Those were kind of the main things you were looking for. Yeah, those were the main things, but I guess we ought to go through the list of, of the things that we ended up measuring on that mission. So the thermal properties that, that we've been talking about were all three of the main thermal properties, thermal conductivity, uh, heat capacity and thermal diffusivity. So, you know, measuring the heat storage capacity of the soil, how how well it conducts heat, and and really the speed of of the movement of um, of a heat wave through the soil and in the depth to which it penetrates. You know, on a diurnal cycle, those were all the thermal bits that we were doing. We we're also measuring dielectric permittivity and electrical conductivity of the soil, which are pretty strong indicators of unfrozen water. So they were pretty convinced from the um, uh, remotely sensed data that there was an ice layer present, but being able to determine if uh, that water could be induced into entering an unfrozen state and a liquid state was something that was really interesting to those guys. So we made those measurements. We also measured the relative humidity um, and temperature of the atmosphere, and we made a bunch of measurements of wind speed as well. And, you know, one of the interesting bits of this mission is that the original um, measurement list that they asked us to do was quite a bit short of that. Uh, they didn't ask us for the humidity measurement. They didn't ask us for the for the wind speed measurement. But as we got into the thick of this and started working with these guys, they would just kind of offhandedly occasionally say things like, man, it would be great if we had a humidity measurement. You guys know anything about measuring humidity? And Galen will pipe up. He's like, well, that's the whole other half of our company. We measure, you know, water activity and food, which is basically a, a high end relative humidity measurement. And we, we, I think had a sterling 100% track record of saying yes to, to everything they asked us to add on to this, um, to the measurement suite. And, and I mean, it ended up doing really great things. I mean, I, I think that if you went back and, and looked and asked the guys that were involved, even from the NASA site, they would say that it, that it ended up pretty well. I think it has to be said when you talk about all those measurements, you think, oh, that, that won't be a problem. I mean, we need to measure wind speed, relative humidity, you know, soil water content and thermal properties. But you have to all do that all in a hundred grams. 
with with a bare minimum of parts and you're flying this to mars you know grams are at a premium and you can you can do this in 100 grams what was the final weight on that yeah it was it was down below that we got somehow got legislated into having it only be 100 grams and i think that conversation went something like hey can you guys um uh make this under 100 grams we we won't require it and we're like, uh, yeah, we, we think we can probably do that. And then the next thing I read was required to be under 100 grams. I'm like, what? <laughs> but we, we were down in the 90s somewhere, so, so we made it. Oh, good. Oh, good. So what was the process like when you actually got to launch day? I didn't realize it, it, that you had so much lead time. Uh, you said, you know, getting it out in like a couple of years, but then also like, like a weird mix of a lot of time and not a lot of time at all. Um, so can you tell me more about just like what, what it's like on launch day, how long it takes to get there, what that feels like, what that experience was like for you? You know, calibrating this instrument was a really important deal that the, when you take this to Mars, you've got one chance of verifying the results that you get there on, on Mars. And so Doug needed to go down and spend quite a bit of time at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory doing this. Um, at the same time, the the experience there, you know, when you're putting stuff together to go on these missions, they actually have full day class classes on how to connect and disconnect uh, the connectors on on for for your various peripherals onto the lander itself and he's got a couple funny stories so you got to hear about that hi everyone i hope you're enjoying the show interested in learning more Doug and Colin were also featured on Meter Group's podcast, We Measure the World. You can find a link in our show notes. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsor for this episode, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Okay, yes, let's talk calibration. So when we had to take these instruments uh, down to the Jet Propulsion Lab and do the final calibrations on them, what those guys look for is actually a flight unit and a flight spare that are the best of the best of all the instruments that were produced, you know, in the, in the final build. And so we took a couple of instruments down to JPL and it was myself working with uh, one of the engineers down there, Greg Cardell, primarily. And this was probably the longest weeks of work that I have ever done over a couple of week period. We were working 80 plus per week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you add it up, that's a lot of hours per day and not a whole lot of sleep. So we had about a two week period to, to get these things calibrated up. And because we made so many measurements, we had to calibrate the electrical conductivity and the dielectric permittivity and all the thermal properties. And we had to check out the relative humidity sensor and, and make just a whole load of measurements and get all of these documented very, very precisely for the for the records, which actually it's interesting that that those data that we collected there have been combed through by the science com community quite a lot after the mission to try and make sense of all the, the, the data that came down. But we went down and we were in the middle of these calibrations and we were hitting our stride, you know, sleeping a few hours a night up and, and, and working on this stuff. And we were trying to calibrate the dielectric permittivity measurement. And we were doing this in some primary alcohols that have very well-known dielectric permittivities. And we made a few measurements at the low end and then we were looking for one more point and we had bought this special type of alcohol that had a dielectric permittivity in the range that that we wanted and we opened it up and it was solid 
at room temperature. We're like, well, we're not going to get this uh, calibration point unless we heat this up a little bit. And so we put a foil heater under the, the container and and headed out for lunch while it um, while it warmed up and come back for lunch from lunch and. And man, there's a fire engine outside the building and all these people standing out front. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, can can we not get back in? I'm starting to panic. Like, we're not going to get our calibrations done. You know, every second is critical here. And it ends up Mike Hecht was there and he, he came over with one of the firemen. He's like, uh, Doug, the, the, the alcohol started smelling and, and it like put fumes of unknown origin throughout the whole building and it cleared out the building. Somebody pulled a fire alarm. This is a JPL. I mean, this is like hundreds of highly paid scientists and um, engineers that are standing outside waiting for the smell to dissipate after this alcohol fumed the whole place out. Yeah. So this was one of the low points of the mission, I would have to say, you know, as I'm sitting there going, uh, yeah, I just cleaned out a building at at JPL for, for a whole afternoon. So yeah, but, um, Interestingly, the culture down there is is just super fabulous in that there is a culture of not assigning blame, but instead just looking for the root cause, learning from it, and moving on. So not a single person there was, was a jerk about it, which which was just astounding to me. And and especially after you know living in the business world a little bit longer, there's a lot more blame game in, in some scenarios and some organizations than there, but that was not their culture. And, and that was super helpful. Oh, that's lovely. I love that. Yeah. So a little bit more to that, to that story, Abby. Um, so we spent all this time, right, calibrating up that um, that flight unit and cleaning out a building and, and all of this stuff. And, and so they we get our work done and they, they ship that flight unit uh, to Lockheed Martin uh, to put on the actual lander. And so they bolt it on the lander and, and then they go through a well-written and documented process that's called the, the mate and demate process. And so they have somebody who reads the instructions, very carefully written instructions on how to mate the two connectors together to, to plug this thing in, basically. And then they have a QA engineer that's sitting behind them, looking over their shoulder and checking off. They want first person initials and says, yes, I read these procedures and I mated this properly. And then the QA engineer, the redundant guy, says, yes, I observed that this was mated properly and this is connected properly. And they both checked it off and and went on about their business connecting other stuff and then a while later in the process they turned it on and it didn't work and come to find out they had not mated it properly so the connector was off by one pin and they powered it up and put power to communication and potentially compromised the entire instrument and this is way late in the game at this point and so this gets back to the not assigning blame i don't think either of those people lost their job i think that it was just you know something that that happens human error that um, they tried to avoid with their redundancy but it didn't quite work so we get the call hey you got to come calibrate up the flight spare and so ran back to jpl you know immediately spent another two weeks you know, working long hours, got the flight spare up and calibrated and sent it over to Lockheed Martin. So maybe that was my, um, maybe that was my uh, payment for clearing out that building is I had to go down there twice and do these uh, double calibrations. Wow. That is crazy. (laughs) That's, that's wild. So then when they actually launched it were you there to see it go up i mean what was that experience like i know when colin and i were talking he said it's like nine months to get there that sounds both stressful and also something you would just have to force yourself to forget for like nine months to not drive yourself crazy what is that all like yeah it's it's interesting colin probably has his own perspectives on this because we we went down together but we did go down to cape canaveral to to watch this thing launch and it was a a nighttime launch and we're sitting out there with a whole bunch of other folks, you know, waiting for it to go and, and it launches. And that was just a a fabulous feeling. I mean, that was a super exciting feeling like, Hey, wait, that, that thing that we just built that we spent, you know, the last two years building and testing and just basically a little, our baby is launching and actually out of the atmosphere and, and heading to Mars. And so that was super, super duper cool. But then just like you said, you wait for 
nine months. And then those, you know, three minutes of terror or whatever they, they, they talk about happens where, you know, the, the part, part of the mission where you have the highest likelihood that things are going to go wrong happen. And, and that's kind of white knuckle and, and a little bit, um, a little bit scary, but when it finally touched down and we had confirmation that everything was working, then the good feeling came back again. And so that, that was my perspective on, on that, but Colin probably has some different ones. It was a lot of fun to go down and watch it take off the, I mean, this was a childhood dream of mine. I, I, as a kid, I wrote off to, you know, back when we sent letters uh, to, to NASA to get their little posters that they'll send you. And I had, you know, the, planets on the on the wall of my room and some of the the rockets and the idea that I'd ever get to participate more fully in a mission than just as a you know a casual observer uh was was really nothing I ever even hoped to dream of and and so we got to go down there and and you know you always kind of have this this Disneyland kind of vision of of how it might be you know these were folding chairs in a bit of a marshy bit of grass underneath a a very warm tarp at 3 a.m. Uh, and the mosquitoes were unbelievably thick. And and so that's the downside. The the upside was that the way we were just there and suddenly this this thing just lights up the sky. You could just see it in the dark and the lights over, you know, I don't know, two two or three miles away, something like that, and and uh or more. It was on the order of that. And and when that rocket goes off the whole sky is light you know you, you can just just see everything and it goes up there and it was just the coolest feeling and then Doug and I got to go over the, they were like you get a free pass to Kennedy Space Center so we had nothing to do and you know after it takes off we were kind of bored and went over there and right there at the Kennedy Space Center there was uh, a a model of the Phoenix Lander and our little TCP sensor was was there we could see it you know, just in a, in a model, and that was pretty exciting. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and maintain my chill. I just is so excited about this. So then, you obviously made it. It successfully landed. You made it through your three minutes of terror, and then is like is NASA just running the show at that point as far as taking the measurements? And then, what did they find? Yeah, those are, those are good questions. So, so I actually had the opportunity to be part of the, the, the science team and the mission control down in, in Arizona on this, but I had to decline that offer because we had twins tw uh, on top of a, a little bit older daughter right at that point. And for the sake of my marriage, um, decided that that wouldn't be a great opportunity to go down there and live on Martian time because they had to actually align themselves with the Martian souls or or days, which are a little bit different from, from Earth days. And so didn't end up taking a super active role in that, but uh, certainly consulted with those guys quite a lot as they um, used the instrument over the course of the mission. The, I, I will say that you know, after the fact, there's maybe just a little bit of disappointment that they didn't use the instrument as much as, as I would have hoped that they did. But for them to get most bang for the buck uh, out of the instrument and the, the most valuable data, they needed to leave that robot arm. Well, let me back up. The, the thermal and electrical conductivity probe was bolted on the robot arm right next to the scoop that was used to deliver sample to all of these other instruments that Colin talked about. So the wet chemistry lab and the, the microscopy set and all of those things. And they were having a lot of trouble getting a uh, sample through the screen to get into the wet chem lab. And so they spent a whole lot of time trying to shake things and do things. And so they spent a lot of days working on that. And for the, the TSIP to be most useful, it needed to be inserted into the soil and left there for a full diurnal period, so, you know, a full day. And so anytime they did that, they couldn't do any other measurements over the course of the day, basically. And so I can't remember how many it was. Colin, do you remember? Maybe they maybe they did six or seven full-day measurements with the, with the TSIP. And I would have liked it to be, you know, 30 days out of the 30-day mission, but that, that wasn't quite um, in the cards. 
It was kind of it was kind of interesting that um, well, a couple of things the the delivery of sample into the into these other cells, the electron force microscope, the wet chemistry, and, and that kind of stuff was a key piece of this mission. And there was some concern that that if they put the probe into the soil, left it overnight, and somehow got ice build up there, that they couldn't pull the arm out. And that we we essentially ruin the mission uh, by having the the probe stuck because they couldn't do all the other things that that they want to do. Now that didn't end up being true, but it's something that they were concerned about. And I think you know I want to give the listeners a pretty clear picture of how this stuff happens because when I imagine the Mars mission, I imagine the the little fun toy that you, you sometimes go to the park and find a little scoop there. And the scoop was about the size of one of those those park toys that you can kind of use the little levers and dig in the sand. And I imagined there would just be some engineer who would be sitting at, at, at this mission control just kind of driving the scoop around. But that's not the case. That It takes 12 minutes, I think, Doug, to get between here and Mars, a radio transmission, and so it's not like that just happens, you know, like that. You you send the program up and it does the things it was going to do. And then it sends the information back the next day and you'll find out how things went. And so if it gets stuck in the ice, it's it's stuck in the ice. There There's nobody kind of doing little things to, to get it out of the ice. And there at Mission Control, they had an identical uh, lander there, or a... a a Phoenix lander to run all the stuff that they were going to do the next day. So they programmed this all up, including the science team kind of telling them, hey, this is what we want to do with the Mecca stuff, including TSIP. They'd run the whole thing on the lander there, and then they'd run, they'd send it to Mars because the last thing you want to do is just mess that all, all up. Yeah, so they were, they were scripting on a daily basis, just like Colin said. So you, you talk about latency, you know, script it up, send it up there you know, wait a day, get it back, script the next day. So, yeah, no no near real time. So did you get the results that you were hoping for or looking for? Or I guess uh, maybe a better question is, like, what insights did you get from your results? So I think the, the result that a lot of the Martian scientific community was looking for was – proof of that you could create liquid water on the surface of Mars, even for a short period of time. So if, if you ever talk to a, a planetary biologist or an astrobiologist, they, they get real fired up about um, uh, short life cycle organisms. So, so the, the temperature and pressure on Mars is such that you would only expect water to exist in ice form and in vapor form. Okay, but what they wanted to do was dig a hole down to that ice layer and basically uh, change the radiative conditions, let that be sunlit, and see if for some short transient amount of time the water would, instead of sublimating away straight from the ice layer to the vapor layer, see if it would go into the liquid water stage. And, and if that's... If that's the case, then that opens up the possibility that, hey, you know, when an asteroid hits Mars, right, and it opens up a crater, then that crater heats up from the sunlight and maybe you get some liquid water and the microbes, you know, come out of dormancy that they've been in for thousands of years and, and have a life cycle real quick and then go back. I mean, it's it sounds far-fetched, but it, I mean, it's something that's at least plausible. And so I think that there were some that were hoping that we could prove that that liquid water was possible even under these Martian conditions. But unfortunately, the data did not suggest that to be true. Ugh, bummer. But there were plenty of other super interesting results. I mean, the, the, the TISA did a really good job. It made a lot of super important measurements. I mean, some of the less um, groundbreaking ones are, uh, you know, the thermal properties. Yes, we found that the that the thermal conductivity was within the range of what they expected. Same um, that the heat capacity indicated a nice low density soil, just like you'd expect without a lot of, lot of compaction. And they uh, measured what's called a damping depth, which is basically the, the depth that the energy from the sun penetrates into the soil on a daily basis. And that almost exactly met, met, matched 
the depth to the ice layer about six centimeters deep. And so a lot of these things were, you know, check our remotely sensed data looked really good. Okay, check. Yeah. Okay. All of our in situ measurements and our ground truths now look really good. So the thermal were, were fairly interesting. The dielectric permittivity measurements, the measurements of unfrozen water were a little bit more interesting in that late in the mission, um, as the whatever polar region it was, I guess, I don't know if you really have a north or south, but as you were approaching fall um, and getting the shorter days and, and, and cooler temperatures, well, first of all, they detected with the relative humidity sensor that they often get to 100% relative humidity at night. So they get saturated conditions. And they were pretty sure that they were getting um, condensation or frost actually on the surface of the lander. And the LIDAR instrument that was on the, um, on the lander, it, they think they detected uh, water snow. So ice snow falling, you know, from the, from the saturated uh, atmosphere. But as that was occurring, the uh, dielectric permittivity or the unfrozen water measurement capability of the, the TSIP uh, started to increase in the soil. So they, they saw these diurnal cycles where they were getting a higher dielectric permittivity in the soil than they expected. And it was very implausible that that would be unfrozen water, but that measurement is a little bit sensitive to, to ice. And so there's um, a whole, I mean, there's a couple of papers out on it now, I think, talking about how they suspect that, that the soil was... Uh, getting really cold and attracting the, the, the dew and the frost actually. And, and so that, that was a pretty exciting find that you, that you get frost, you know, actual condensation and, and, and frost buildup of, of water ice uh, on the surfaces of Mars. Wow. Okay. This is going to be, uh, this is my super dumb question for the show. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe there will be another. So, okay. You said that it's like either ice or vapor. Does that mean that it just go like just instantly from like one to the other? There's no rain. It's just like there wasn't snow, but it's really <laughs> humid. And then it's just now we have snow or ice. Is that how that works? Yeah, pre pretty much. I mean, if you, if you, well, I think most of us probably follow the popular literature and, and, you know, there's a lot of speculation that earlier in Mars's history, it was kind of a warmer, moister place. But in the present day, because of the very low temperatures and also because of the very low pressure, Mars apparently has lost a lot of its atmosphere over the eons. Um, it, it sits at a point in the... Um, uh, in that temperature pressure regime where the water will come straight from ice form and sublimate is what it's called sublimation straight to the vapor phase so that's what that's what the temperature and pressure predict now the the hope was that if you warm it up fast enough maybe it goes maybe it goes liquid for just a little bit wow that is wild <laughs> my brain is just uh, struggling with that one so that'll be fun to chew on for a while Okay, so I'm going to kind of group these next two questions together because we've kind of touched a little bit on both of them. And so it's kind of like what value, like me as just a regular human being on Earth, not anywhere close to Mars at all, why is this important information for me? What can it do? And then like what is the future of soil sensing on Mars or just kind of this kind of research in general, you know, specifically as it ties in with things like soil science, environmental science, agriculture, maybe like where are we heading with this information? What's the ultimate end goal? So I think that the value to to humanity and the value to, to anybody who wanted to, you know, study up on the results really is it's kind of one of the small little pieces of, of the search for you know, the possibility of extraterrestrial life. You know, Mars is our close neighbor with the, the you know, highest probability of any other planet in our solar system of, of ever having had life. And, you know, going up and, and trying to understand, you know, the history and, and, you know, the present day conditions and how they relate to, to extraterrestrial life is, I mean, it's a little tiny small bit of a really, really exciting and, and really, really important question for for all of us, I think. 
when I think about measurements on Mars, I agree with Doug that that you know it's just adding little pieces to our knowledge. When you think about doing measurements on another planet and and getting instrumentation out uh, over there to to do this work, it's actually an incredibly difficult task, but not undoable. When we were actually putting together proposals for this mission, one of the other missions was this idea that you could fly some kind of, I never actually saw a picture of what the proposal was, but some kind of, of plane, I don't know, that you would kind of put together when you got to Mars down into the atmosphere, scoop up some of the atmosphere and and then go back to your your craft and then send it back to Earth so we could actually analyze some some of the atmosphere of Mars here on Earth with, with our better instruments. When you think about that being a legitimate proposal, I think it was one of the final three in in the the proposal list that TCP was in. Now Phoenix Lander eventually became the winner and you think, wow, there you know how much work are you doing just to get this little piece of understanding to take us one step further? And that's really what what Phoenix did. I, it's not a, a huge step, but it is a, a critical step that, that we understand the, the science there on Mars, the, the behavior, the, the qualities of, of the Martian surface one step better. And together with some of these these rovers and other things that are there, are we just grow this and grow this till eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to send a, a manned mission to Mars. And and I think that's that's actually critical. Although when you look at it, oh hey, we measured a little change in the dielectric, we measured humidity at one hundred percent, you know, some thermal properties that match our models. Maybe you'll sit back and say, okay, well, what's well, a big deal? You already kind of knew that. But at the end of the day, trying to understand all these details is absolutely critical. Things like like tying in the the, the thermal properties and other these pieces into the global climate models that we have for Mars is going to make it possible to do some of these things we want to do in the future. And sometimes people will be like, oh, you were just on a lander. You didn't go on a rover. You didn't wander around and see all these things. You only, your mission only lasted five months. And, and there is a... You know, there's a balance to all of these things. On the rover, you can't get the kind of quality of measurement that we got on the lander. And and so we do the lander, we do the rovers, we get a lot of these pieces, we aggregate them, these p- pieces of information, and then we're able to move forward. Sure, sure. Yeah. Any any step forward is a step forward. Um, wow. I, <laughs> I think it's awesome you were on a lander, so I don't know where that's coming from. Uh <laughs> Well, Colin touched on the rovers a little bit in, in, in your last question, Abby, you asked about, you know, what, what the future of this type of research is and, and really the, the future from the standpoint of Phoenix and, and TSIP was, is, is our history now that there's been a lot more missions that have gone up and there's been a lot more learnings that have, that have happened, you know, since that time. So a couple of sets of rovers that are doing some super interesting research on some, you know, some of the landforms that, that show clear evidence of, of liquid water in the past. And, and I mean, a lot of that research is, is, is really, really groundbreaking. And, and I feel like we laid some of the groundwork for that. And that's an important bit of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to ask one other question related to the future results. Terraforming. (laughs) Talk to me about that. Is that like, is this a foundational step towards that? Or are people just like, nah, I I do not follow the popular literature. So you've been hanging out with Elon Musk, haven't you? (laughs) (laughs) I I have not been hanging out with him. He's a little outside my uh, social circles, I think. Well, I mean, that's that's a lot of the basis for for his whole grand scheme, I think, is to try and, you know, put people on Mars and and the terraforming that goes with it. So um, I think that's a little bit beyond, you know, my interest level. I think by the time any of that happens, um, I'll probably be in the ground here. But um, but but we'll see. It's certainly interesting. One of the things that, that they found, I think, is is a pretty heavy perchlorate in the soil and the regolith, shall we say, regolith being the, the non-biological soil. So there's, there's, there's no biologicals in the soil. We call it regolith. Um, and so 
you couldn't grow stuff in the soil, I don't think. Um, so in, in any way, we're on the on the poles where we were. So, you know, during the, the winter time, you know, you're under many meters of, of CO2 ice. So that also would decrease kind of the, the total amount of joy. In fact, our mission could have we we went all the five months of the the, the summer essentially at the pole and finished that out. And they didn't really think about it because their their mission was just to make it three months at least, and they made it five months. And it turns out that that it was so efficient with the power that that we probably could have actually done the next summer and made more measurements. But unfortunately. They didn't really plan for that with the solar panels. And, and when they got frozen in the CO2 ice, presumably, and it never woke up, presumably the, the, the solar panels, which were really flimsy, you can imagine trying to fly a bunch of stuff over there. The solar panels had to be really, really light that the CO2 ice kind of broke them apart. But it worked so well that it could have gone another summer had we been able to, to keep those solar panels working. So, Colin, you talked about, you know, the perchlorate. You know, strong oxidizer in the in the regolith there, making it, you know, difficult to grow crops. But I disagree. Haven't you seen The Martian with um, Matt Damon? I mean, come yeah, on, he grew potatoes. And, and, yeah, he did. I, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking hydroponics. You know, I'm, I'm thinking. No, I I don't know exactly in, in later science, and I I just don't know the answer to this question. May have may have found that there aren't perchlorates at, at in the equator, you know, where the rovers are down at lower latitudes. I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Matt Damon had some fertilizer help, so yeah, maybe he that did. makes a difference. <laughs> That's know. right. He had fertilizer help. But, you know, remember Colin was just uh, saying a little bit earlier that we had to keep this sensor under 100 grams. It just made me scratch my head a little bit that they took a sack of potatoes and blasted them off <laughs> and sent them to Mars. I, I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. They're, they're, potatoes are heavy, man. <laughs> it makes a difference. <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad you guys brought up the Martian because I really wanted to ask, but I was like, no, don't Fair just game. let it Hit lie. It. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought it up. I've been spending too much time with my uh, sci-fi TV shows and, and novels, so that's that's where that comes from for me. Um, we're running low on time, so I will uh, start winding down this conversation. Though I could just go for hours and hours, given just free access to your calendars. Um, so final three questions for you. First one is if people want to learn more about these topics that we've talked about, whether it's the lander itself, um, the results that came out of it, anything related to this, where can they go? So all of the data from the mission and all of the pictures, interestingly, if you guys ever want to see some pretty cool pictures from the surface of Mars, those are all, um, available in the public domain you just have to search them on the the nasa website and if you're interested in actually doing research with those data then that is fully okay as well so i think that the science team for the mission got first crack at writing a few papers and publishing those in nature and science but then um those opened up to everybody and there's been a lot of planetary researchers that have grabbed those data we also have um you know some various other uh, pieces of information. If you're not interested in, in diving into the hard results, we, we do have that webinar that Mike Hecht gave for us at one point uh, here at Meter that he talked about the science and the and the development. And it was kind of interesting hearing his comments from a, a different standpoint. So this was, uh, you know, our main guy at JPL talking about their experience working, working with us on this as opposed to us talking about our experience working with him. So I, I did enjoy that. Yeah, we will for sure have links to all that in our show notes. Um, the other one I wanted to point out uh, is you also did an episode on Meter's podcast, uh, We Measure the World. Um, so you can go listen to that as well. We'll include a link there. Second question is if people want to get involved with this kind of work, how can they take those first steps? So... Being that, that we kind of backed into this, right, that, that they came and found us, I've been asked about that from time to time. Hey, we want to be involved in, in NASA or JPL. How, how do we do that? And, and my first response is, I have no idea. Um, but, but really, there, there's a group, 
it, for example, at, at the American Geophysical Union that, that deals with interplanetary science, it works right along. You know, the ASA, uh, SSSA members are often going there as well, connecting through. And and so that would be a place to, to just see what's going on, what's the, the current interest. Um, there are also just projects that you can you go on to NASA's website and see some of these things. They, they do have calls for proposals for various things. And, and we have colleagues who are out there doing, for example, zero gravity research on, on plant performance and that kind of stuff. And, and so those, th those opportunities are out there. Uh, if you look around, see who might be doing that and just connect with those scientists and say, hey, I'm interested in participating. Is there a level that, that I can participate with some of my experience? That, that's certainly possible. And if you go to the trade show, just put your sensor out on, on the table and see if anybody walks by and says, hey, could that fly to Mars? So Colin, Colin's being a little flippant there, but but I, until much later, did not have any idea how lucky we were to be involved in this project. There are people that go their whole career wanting to try and get something to fly to outer space or, or go to Mars and are unable to do that. And we, like Colin said, just backed into it by basically blind luck and, and ended up with an instrument that flew to Mars. Who was it, Colin? Was it Henry Lynn? Do you remember when Henry Lynn? Yeah. Henry is a, um, a soil pedologist that, that unfortunately passed away recently um, that was so excited for us. He's like, Doug, this is all I want. This is what I want in my career is to fly something to Mars. And you did that already. And he was super jealous about it. And it was, it was just kind of funny hearing his, his perspectives on it. Sure, sure. An absolute gift for sure. Uh, what what an experience. So, uh, I mean, coming off of this episode, maybe this is a way less interesting question, but what is one fun fact about you that people would not know if all they had was this podcast um, or your research besides emptying a building at JPL and flying something to Mars? For me, I, I ran track at Duke. How about that? All right. That's yeah. a great fun fact. We have two Maine Coon cats at home that weigh 16 pounds each, and they're very sweet. Aww. They join. They come and meet me at the door every time I get home, so they, they're kind of fun. Wow, that's surprisingly affectionate for cats. That's great. They are. They're they're a fun breed. <laughs> what are what are their names? Uh, Stella and Luna. Uh. The, the, one's kind of uh, star like, and one's kind of uh, moon like. So, man. Sp space everywhere you go. <laughs> I know one. One kind of looks like Mars. Uh, she's she's got a nice reddish color. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 very affectionate. They're fun fun cats to have around. And people, I'm not a cat guy, so I, I prefer dogs. But these are the most dog dog like cat breed, and they're they're just a big a big cat. Ah, lovely. You can maybe you'll get like a tabby or something. That's like red adjacent. <laughs> That's right. You can call it Mars. Well, thank you so much for taking so much time out of your day to talk to us on this episode. Obviously, super exciting work, uh, super cool opportunity, and it was so great to have you on the show today. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Abby. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Rachel. Rachel, welcome to the show. Can you start off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Rachel LaCroix. I'm a PhD student studying at Cornell University with Johannes Lehmann in the field of soil and crop sciences. Wonderful. And what are you currently researching? So broadly, my research is focused on how and why carbon remains in the soil, but more specifically, I study how the diversity of the molecular compounds that comprise this decaying organic matter in the soil contributes to its overall ability to be used by bacteria or fungi as a food source. So we expect that the molecular diversity of these organic compounds in soil has an impact on how quickly a soil microbe can further decompose uh, that pool of organic matter and respire it back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Wonderful. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? So because the, the history of soil science really fascinates me, my dream project would probably be geared towards writing about history of certain aspects of soil science. So 
so I really like being able to see like this big picture arcs of how our understanding of concepts or mechanisms have evolved over time. So perhaps I'd want this to be able to, you know, compile data that shows how and when our understanding shifted and try to correlate that with maybe new technologies that started to be used in our field. Wonderful. If anyone would like to get in touch with Rachel about her work, we'll have her contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much for having me. for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.